Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sheila Lucard. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education at the School of Medicine. And I'd like to welcome you all to this collaborative seminar uh, event today, which will feature scientists from the University of Washington, from the Allen Institute, and from the Hutch. We had our first um, event, collaborative event, last spring at the Allen Institute, where we heard a little bit about each of the institutions. But this academic year, we're focusing on the actual science that goes on in all of those institutions. And um, we will be having three topics throughout the year. There'll be quarterly um, presentations, and the locations will ro the location will rotate. The next one will be at the Hutch, the next, and then the, the spring one will be at the Allen Institute. And each seminar will feature a speaker from each of the three institutions. And they'll each speak for about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll have a discussion at the end for those of you who have questions. And today our focus is on neuroscience. In the winter, it will be big data. And in spring, will be cell biology. Uh, and after the discussion period today, we will uh, have a reception outside. You're all welcome to stay and eat and drink and get to know each other a little bit. Less formally, not informally. So our first speaker uh, today is Cecilia Mullins. She's a full member in basic sciences at the Hutch and has been there since 1998. She's also an affiliate professor in biology and biological structure at the University of Washington. She got her bachelor's degree in biology at York University and her PhD in molecular and medical genetics at the University of Toronto. Then did a postdoc at University of Oregon. She's been a, a, Hugh, a Howard Hughes investigator, and she studies the early development of the vertebrate brain. And today she'll be talking to us about a temporal mechanism for topographic map development. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so uh, my lab studies the development of the nervous system using the zebrafish model. Uh, and the zebrafish model doesn't get a lot of air time down here on South Lake Union, and so I will uh, hopefully be able to um, sort of give you a sense of the, the premise for using this system and why, why it's a great one for developmental uh, neurobiology. So um, topographic maps uh, are a mechanism or are, are uh, a representation of the outside world on inside the brain. Um, they are often representing the, a surface of the on, the on the periphery of an animal uh, in its brain or perhaps musculature in the brain. Uh, and topographic maps, the, sort of one of the characteristics of them is that the sort of neighbor-neighbor relationships of neurons in the projecting surface uh, correlate with the neighbor-neighbor relationships of uh, cells in the target field, neurons in the target field or, or, or muscle target, or whatever is being targeted. Um, and topographic, topographic maps are sort of fascinating to developmental biologists because they involve uh, a number of, of important sort of developmental processes, the establishment of, of spatial information, gradients of spatial information on these surfaces within the brain and in the periphery, and then the axon guidance, guidance events that allow neurons to uh, project uh, from, from the projecting surface to the target surface and maintain these neighbor-neighbor relationships is a very interesting one to ask for a developmental biologists. And so I'm going to talk today about topographic mapping of cranial motor neurons into the head musculature. So cranial motor neurons in us and in fish uh, arise in the brain stem, the hindbrain, and uh, project out of the brain and into the muscles uh, of the head and neck that, in, that, for, that are required in us for things like chewing, uh, facial expression, uh, swallowing and speech. Uh, in particular, you can see in just in this picture here. This is a zebrafish head. Uh, in, in its motor cranial motor neurons are lit up with GFP with the marker that I'm going to use a lot. This is an islet one driver driving GFP here in motor neurons. And uh, what you can I already appreciate just looking at this is that there is a topographic map here whereby the anterior most neurons project to the anterior most targets and posterior neurons project to more posterior targets. Today, in particular, I'm going to talk about topographic mapping of these motor neurons here. This is a vagus motor nucleus, which in us is involved in speech and swallowing. And then also, there's a major visceral branch that projects into our viscera and controls things like heartbeat, 
um, breathing and uh, digestion, so the peristalsis in the gut. Um, the vagus motor neurons in all vertebrates gather, uh, their axons gather in the head outside of the brain into one large fascicle that re goes out into the periphery and then branches again in these, ver these five distinct branches. And those five branches correspond to the posterior pharyngeal arches. So in, uh, in fish, those, are, uh, those muscles are involved in gill movements. In, in us, they're involved in speech and swallowing, and then again in this, this visceral component. So we use the zebrafish for our studies for um, the obvious reason that you can see even just here looking at this picture is that it's transparent and it's also very small and it develops externally and so which means that we can watch the establishment of a topographic map in real time. So this is a confocal movie showing these are vagus motor neurons, individual vagus motor neurons, that's a, a macrophage, you can ignore that. It's fun too, but it's not what we're talking about today. Um, but the, these are vagus motor neurons making their axons, projecting them out of the nervous system and then into this common fascicle up here. So we can study these events as they're happening. In fish, this, in zebrafish, this, that process of establishing the vagus top topographic map happens in the second and third day of development. So that's another reason for using the fish is that things happen fast. Early development at least happens fast. Okay. So there is a topographic map in the vagus motor nucleus. So the vagus motor nucleus is, is up here in this picture. Here again are these branches in the periphery. If you label those branches uh, with a retrograde tracing dye, this is, this is a human. You wouldn't do this in a human, but you would, might do it in a rat, as has been done here. So the, the two branches that I'm focusing on here in this person uh, are the branch that goes into the fourth pharyngeal arch, which in people is called the superior laryngeal nerve. And uh, the sixth branch, or the branch in the sixth pharyngeal arch, which in people is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, because of the evolution of the neck, the recurrent laryngeal nerve has to take a bit of a detour down into the thorax and back up into the throat again. Both of these the nerves innervate different parts of the larynx. So if you label those with retrograde dye in the rat, you would see that when you project, look at the projection of those neurons inside the brain, uh, that they would go to different targets, and that those targets would be separated in the vagus motor nucleus along its anterior posterior axis. So the more anterior one of these branches, the fourth pharyngeal arch branch, would project here, uh, and the more posterior branch, the seventh pharyngeal arch branch, would be back here. Okay, so anterior posterior distinction. That's a that's a topographic map. So if we can do the same sort of thing in the zebrafish, the larval zebrafish, which is what we study. Uh, now, the larval zebrafish is quite a lot smaller. So this is to scale. So you can fit most of a larval, larval zebrafish inside the vagus motor nucleus of a rat, of an adult rat. Uh, and so using these kind of uh, linear tracing approaches where you would, you would cut a nerve and apply a dye to it are, they are hard. Uh, and instead, we use photoconvertible dyes, and I'm going to so uh, so uh, genetically encoded photoconvertible proteins like Kida is what we are using here, where we can photoconvert branches in the individual pharyngeal arches, and then let that photoconverted protein retrogradely label the neurons that uh, that were are connected to the axons where we, that we photoconverted. And so, what you can see from that, so this is the vagus motor nucleus here, uh, circled. And with a dotted line, and if we photoconvert uh, pharyngeal arch four versus pharyngeal arch seven versus this visceral branch, sorry, you can barely see that uh, without the lights completely off. But what you can see is that the motor neurons that get filled are progressively more posterior in the vagus motor nucleus. So again, a topographic map. And so because we can see this map in a larval zebrafish, now we can study it. And then our goal is to study it genetically to try to understand what are the molecules that would uh, allow this distinct targeting of individual motor neurons along the anterior posterior axis of the vagus motor nucleus into these different pharyngeal arch branches, okay? And so what I'm gonna tell you about then today is sort of the principle that we think that we've discovered that explains uh, how this map develops, but not the molecules yet. That's sort of our next goal is to understand sort of the genetic components and that's another good thing, or another thing that the zebrafish is good for. So, just generally, topographic maps can form by a couple of different mechanisms, or probably everything in between. And the, the classic chemoaffinity model for how a topographic map forms that governs how topographic maps form in the retinotectal system is one in which spatial information in the projecting field is kind of matched up with corresponding spatial information in the target field. So for instance, 
a, a receptor for some ligand would be expressed, or, or different receptors would be expressed along the anterior posterior axis of the vagus motor nucleus, and corresponding ligands would be differentially expressed along in the different pharyngeal arches. And so these, these neurons would find this arch because of that sort of chemo affinity of, um, mechanism. So this is a purely spatial mechanism, but another possible way that uh, a topograph, topographic map could form, at least in principle, would be through a sort of a temporal mechanism, whereby neurons in the projecting field uh, generate their axons, either are specified or generate their axons at different times. Those axons reach the target field at different times, and that the targets are available at correspondingly different times for innervation. And so that they're over a period of time, axons would be generated and find their targets in the periphery. Uh, uh, over a period of time. Now, we know for a fact that pharyngeal arches form over time uh, during development, and we really started thinking about this mechanism when we watched the branching of the vagus motor axons into the pharyngeal arches and noticed that they take that, that they uh, branch sequentially. Those, br those branches arise sequentially. So branch number four, branch number five is forming here. Number six is forming into pharyngeal arch six is forming there, and now pharyngeal arch seven branch is just forming. Okay, over the course of uh, this time lapse, which would, would would have been about twelve hours of development. Okay, and so we had a sense that there was a temporal thing going on here, a temporal aspect, and we we that was confirmed in our minds when we did use photoconversion to watch the axon axons of posterior motor neurons uh, compared to anterior motor neurons within the vagus motor nucleus. And I should say that in every picture I'm going to show you, uh, anterior is over here to the left by convention, and dorsal is to the top. Okay? So you, well, this is a movie then starting at about 29 hours of zebrafish development. And what you'll see, what we've done is or Gabby, the graduate student who's done all of the work I'm telling you about today, she's photoconverted the posterior motor, motor neurons. And we're going to watch the movie. And what you're seeing in this white panel here is just the photoconverted neuron, okay? Sort of in an inverted color. So what you can see is that axons come out, and at 37 hours, the, and the, the green axon, or green motor neurons, have established a very thorough branch, but the, at, th at that time point is when the posterior axons have just started to project. And so, again, it'll pause at 39 hours just as the posterior neurons are, are beginning to make axons, and you'll see how fully developed the anterior axons are. Sorry. One more time. Okay, so now is when, they, when the posterior axons just start to form after the anterior ones are really well developed. Okay? And this, in fact, when she quantitates this, this is the difference, about seven hours worth of difference in time uh, between when anterior vagus motor neurons make their axons and posterior vag vagus motor neurons make their axons. So there's a correlation then between the timing of axogenesis and the pharyngeal arch target. We can say that based on these experiments. And, and I'm not showing you data that suggests that all of these neurons actually are born at around the same time, within about an hour of each other. And what the difference is, is, when, is in when the axons emerge, not when the neurons actually appear. Okay. So does the position of a neuron determine the timing of its targeting? So the way you can ask that question is, of course, to change position and ask about timing and targeting, right? And the way to change position would be what you'd like to be able to do is to take one of these neurons before it makes an axon, just before it makes an axon, when it's post-mitotic but hasn't made an axon yet, and transplant it back here and ask, is its axogenesis delayed and is, it tar is its targeting changed? So from an anterior position, where anterior branch to a posterior branch. And so we can do those experiments in the zebrafish. That's another nice thing about the zebrafish. So this is, what we have is a donor that has red in its motor neurons and a host that has green in its motor neurons. And we transplant, in this case, just a single uh, vagus motor neuron. And then this is a control experiment, so anterior to anterior. And we can then put this transplanted embryo onto a confocal microscope about three hours or three and a half hours after the transplantation and watch its axon emerge. And so you can't really see the axon emerge in this channel, but you can see it over here. So we'll make that happen. So here goes the axon. And then branching out into the pharyngeal arches. And I'll tell you where it goes in just a second. But what you can see is that within uh, about an hour of the movie starting, this uh, neuron has started to make its, its axon. Okay, so pretty quickly. 
Conversely, if we transplant that uh, one of those rodent neurons, or in this case two of them, from an anterior part of a red donor to the posterior vagus motor nucleus of a green host, and then start the movie, what we see is we start the movie at about three hours after transplantation, and it takes all the way up until seven, nine hours before those axons, those neurons start to make their axons, and then, and then here they come. Okay? So there's again a delay in the timing of axigenesis that's dependent on the position where these cells are placed. And they're, they're labile in terms of they can be changed. They're just, their timing of axigenesis can be changed depending on their position. Okay. So, and this is the quantitation of that. The difference, so an anterior neuron transplanted to posterior is delayed in axon outgrowth. And conversely, a posterior ax neuron transplanted to anterior is accelerated in its timing of axon outgrowth. So position really seems to determine something important about timing. Although I should say that this difference is not as big as the difference of, that the neurons, the axons emerge just endogenously. So there is, some, there is probably more going on. Okay, so that, then, that says that the timing of axon outgrowth, outgrowth is determined by position. What about the targeting? That was that's really the question. Is the targeting so anterior to anterior transplants? That here's that neuron after its axon is fully elaborated, and there it is in the fourth pharyngeal arch when we zoom in. Okay. Conversely, when we transplant an anterior neuron to a posterior position and let its axon grow out, it ends up in the PA7 seventh pharyngeal arch in the visceral branch. Okay. So yes, it changes it changes timing of axon outgrowth and it changes position. Sorry, it changes its targeting. And this is the quantitation. So in, in light green, sorry about the color, uh, in light green, this is what happens after a neuron is transplanted to an anterior position. It really switches its, uh, its targeting from anterior branches to posterior branches. OK. So, so far, I've told you then that position determines timing and position determines targeting. So the last question then is, does timing determine targeting? Right? So, so those two are not necessarily, that's not necessarily the case based on these two things. And so you want to ask the question, does timing determine targeting? And what you'd really like to do is then uh, do something to a neuron in an anterior position that delays its axon outgrowth and ask, does it now change its targeting to a posterior branch? We haven't yet figured out how to do that. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to fake it by transplanting a, a cell from an early embryo into the same position in a late embryo. So that transplanted cell is making an axon sort of for its environment at a late time for its position. So it should make an axon early, and it's because it's a, a younger neuron, it makes an axon too late, right? And then we ask what happens. So this is a sort of schematizing that. So this is a young donor and an older host. The young donor before axigenesis, the older host after axigenesis, at least in these anterior axons. <clears throat> Translate to the very same place, just all of just a different age, and ask where does the axon go? And if, if position determines uh, if timing determines targeting, then we predict that it is going to target together with these neurons that are projecting at that time, right? And in fact, that's what we see. So this is just that experiment. It's, an, it's the same position, from, but a heterochronic young to old transplantation. Here's that red neuron right there. You can barely just see it pink in the anterior end of the vagus nucleus. And now instead of targeting a PA4, which is where it's supposed to go, it goes and targets the visceral brain. So the position is determining the timing, and the position is determining targeting, and timing is determining targeting. Okay. So the next question, of course, that we want to answer is what determines the timing of axigenesis? That's really so all that I've done so far for you in this presentation is to the sort of distill a big question, how does a topographic map form to uh, a smaller, although still big question, which is how is the timing of axigenesis? control uh, in the vagus motor nucleus. Now, we know a lot about axigenesis, but we know rather little from any model system about how the timing of axigenesis is determined. So what, deter what determines those events that allow an axon to be specified and then to grow <coughs> out uh, of a, any kind of neuron? And so that's our challenge, and this is my last slide. So uh, our what I, have, I haven't told you that we actually have some insights into what distinguishes the anterior vagus motor nucleus from the posterior vagus motor nucleus. And the developmental biologists among you won't be surprised to hear that that is a Hox gene. So Hox, that Gab has identified Hox genes that distinguish anterior from posterior uh, neurons. And those are, uh, so Hox genes are transcription factors that specify regional identities everywhere in every organism. 
Uh, and so her, and she's determined, so this is in green, is, a, is the Hox gene that distinguishes anterior vagus from posterior vagus motor neurons. And she's determined in transplantation that from anterior to posterior, that transplanted neurons turn on that Hox gene when they are moved to the posterior end. Uh, of vagus motor nucleus. So the cell position determines, among the other, uh, in addition to the other things I just told you, also determines Hox profile, <coughs> Hox gene expression. Uh, this is Hox 5 genes in particular. We hypothesize that the Hox profile determines timing of axigenesis, and that we're testing by having made CRISPR knockouts of all three of the Hox 5 genes that, that bis bisect this <coughs> vagus motor nucleus. Uh, and then the time where we hypothesize that the timing when an axon, uh, that, that determines timing of axogenesis and that the timing with which an axon reaches the choice point determines its pharyngeal arch target. And so we've designed experiments that are, that are testing that hypothesis as well. And so with that, I will finish uh, and thank Gabby Barsh. This is, uh, Gabby is an MSTP student uh, in my lab who's, who's going to be finishing up this year, um, who's done, who did all of the work that I told you about. This is my lab at the Hutch, and uh, I can take questions if there's time. I don't, I'm not sure if I've gone We'll do all the questions at the end. Okay, fine. So. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Adrienne Parahal. She is a professor of physiology and biophysics at the University of Washington and has adjunct appointments in physics and applied mathematics. She got an honors degree in theoretical physics at the Australian National University and her PhD at the Wiseman Institute and a postdoc at Princeton. She joined the faculty at UW in 2004, and there she directs the UW Computational Neuroscience Program, and she's co-director of the Institute for Neuroengineering. And today she's going to talk to us about... Neurons to networks. <clears throat> Great, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to be here. So, what I want to talk about today is a couple of different examples of where um, some mathematics can be useful, where theory can be useful in neuroscience. And really, uh, the picture that I always have in my mind when I try to uh, explain why theory is useful to neuroscience is really this one, that, that there are really uh, three different ways that we can think about biological systems, you know, either from the point of view of what it's trying to do, you know, the computation, or what we're usually dealing with, the high-dimensional data, high-dimensional model, that is the actual observations that we take when we're, when we're recording from any neurons, which we'll talk about for maybe, or our attempts to write down all the relevant variables and the dynamics that are participating that in the system that we're interested in, and where uh, I hope that theory and physics can really, really come into play, is trying to take that very complicated observation and turn it into something like a low-dimensional model, a model that involves many fewer variables, that squeezes out the important dynamics that are relevant to understanding why that system carries out the computation that it does. And so we're really always trying to you know, fill in these kind of three legs of the stool in, uh, in trying to understand how a system is one of the most important things is really identifying what the computation is and then translating uh, that function um, into mechanisms. So what's the relationship between what something does with how it, how it does it? So one area where we've been really able to do this quite explicitly to really uh, fill in all of these three, three circles is in the case of single neurons. Now, single neurons have the, the beauty that, you know, thanks to decades of biophysics, we can actually write down, you know, Hutch can have these style equations for how neural behavior uh, works at the single neuron level, and try to turn those complicated single neuron descriptions into something more like what we want to think about them computationally, something like, you know, what's their description in terms of a, a circuit element? That's the <coughs> that has revealed a lot of richness at the single neuron level, more than what would have expected. You know, when we build neural network models, we tend to take non neurons as very simple components. If you really look at the nonlinear dynamics of, of real neurons, you find that there's all kinds of interesting properties that they have. It's not what I'm going to talk about today, though. What I'd like to do is just to start to flesh out how we can go from this uh, very you know, full understanding, reasonably good understanding, at the single neuron level, to low-dimensional models that, that capture what those single neurons are doing, 
trying to understand what those dynamics are contributing to dynamics at the circuit level in terms of real computations, not just transformation from input to output of single neurons, but real and um, sort of network-wide computations. And I'll give you a couple of examples, hopefully brief enough that I can sort of convey some sense. One of them is a collaboration with Bill Moody's lab. Bill, for uh, years, has been looking at wave dynamics in cortex. So if you can slice, and when you see that early in development, you see these enormous waves of activity that go all the way through the slice. There's some images uh, taken by Curtis in his lab. At the same time, so if we look at uh, how prevalent those waves are, they appear uh, over a very limited period during development, so from day E18 through to about day P10. So they appear and die away again. So there's a sort of a brief period during development when these waves are, are present. That is likely due to all kinds of things like the, the uh, kicking in of in inhibition uh, and things like that. But what people are particularly interested in is to what extent the um, intrinsic properties of single neurons can contribute to this difference in, in dynamics at the network level. So if you look at the sodium potassium current in individual neurons and track them over the course of development, you see a scatter plot from recordings taken from many different neurons. So early in development, you know, prior to P10, from E18 through to P10, you see that those values are scattered all over the place, whereas later in development, they all converge onto a line where the sodium to potassium ratio uh, gets to a, a state that's approximately one. So what we then did was to take Hodgkin-Huxley style models that were adjusted for, for sort of mammalian dynamics and looked at what neurons that, that uh, instantiate this kind of behavior do compared to neurons at this, at this other stage. And we found that there were very um, significant changes in their basic sort of uh, computational properties that happen as a result of just that change. So let's just think about a simple example. So if we're interested in wave propagation, we can take a very, very simple neural network, which is just a bunch of neurons that are being stimulated uh, by an incoming wave of activity. We're going to take a wave to be this sort of slowly varying ramp where every neuron is getting some kind of individual noise on top of that ramp. And now let's look at what those two different neuron types do in response to that ramp. So these immature neurons, uh, the prior to P10 neurons, you see that all of those neurons fire at approximately the same time. Whereas later on, what we found is that those neurons are much more sensitive to noise and that the firing of that group of neurons is much less synchronous. And so what it's doing is much more smoothly following the dynamics of that wave. And you can see that here. So now instead of driving it with a wave of activity, we drive it with a, a slowly varying um, input. So every neuron is getting the same slowly varying input. Every neuron in the population is getting a different noise. You see that the immature neurons uh, are, are basically thresholding, just finding those uh, very large uh, deviations in the input, and that input just propagates from layer to layer throughout the network like this. Whereas the, the mature neurons, because of their sensitivity to the noise, they're smoothing out and responding continuously during this slow variation, but as that, that um, activity propagates from layer to layer through the network, you see that that sensitivity to noise is, is getting worse and worse, and so by uh, the time it's gone through a few stages of the network, you barely see any of that slow modulation. Right? So the firing rate of all the neurons is averaging out to about constant. So we'd like to understand why that happens uh, by looking at the individual properties of the neurons and can we come up with some sort of theoretical description of why that is. And so in this case, when we think about you know, what do we mean by sort of the transistor in my, in my original picture, what is the simplified model that captures those dynamics? The very most straightforward thing we can think of is looking at a, at a frequency, an FI curve, right? a, 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 a curve of the, of the response in terms of firing rate as a function of the, of the input. So as a function of input current, what does the output mean firing rate look like? And so the uh, neurons early in development have an FI curve that is just this green line. What can we use that for in thinking about how activity is propagated through a network? We can now turn this into uh, an iterated map. Right? So if we take the output of a, of a given layer of neurons, so we, we put in some input current, it generates some firing rate, we can now reflect that output through this line you know, of uh, input equals output back onto the input to the next layer of the network and now look up again what the value of the, of the firing rate would be for that new input to the next layer of the network. 
And so what this what this code gives us is essentially an iterative map. We look up, you know, we, we iterate from layer to layer to layer, and that gives us the next value of the firing rate of the of the subsequent layer. What is very particular about the dynamics of a map like this is it has what's called a stable fixed point. So if we start here, we iterate, we iterate, we always end up at this at this particular point. So any time when this line y equals x crosses in one place uh, into an output curve, that gives us a stable fixed point. And so the network will always converge to a single value. So what does that mean for propagation through uh, a network of these immature neurons that says that no matter where we start the input firing rate, as we move from layer to layer of the network, all those values um, propagate to be the same firing rate. Right? So no information is propagated through the network about what that initial firing rate looked like. That's very different than the dynamics that we get from the, from the immature network. Sorry, these were the mature neurons. So from the immature neuron network, the FI curve is shaped a little bit differently. And what happens here is that for a lot of the, uh, of the stretch of the, of the input-output relationship, it's almost tangent to that in, the input equals output line. And so what happens is that the input to outputs, they're all approximately uh, held constant. So now when, wherever you start uh, your input, you more or less convey that same value throughout the network from layer to layer. And so you can see that this one simple change in the sodium-potassium ratios in the, in the underlying neuron models is giving us very, very different dynamics for the way that the information in terms of firing rate is propagated through the network. In this case, it loses all information. In this case, it retains the value of those fluctuations as that information goes from layer to layer. All right, so that is one possibility for what might allow uh, wave transmission to happen. Um, later in development, uh, earlier in development rather than later. You know, as uh, we get later in development, information in those waves is just washed out. So we see that these developmental changes in single neuron properties can potentially contribute to changes in this sort of large-scale information transmission in networks. So for another example, and this is work that we've been doing recently with David McCall in, uh, in biology, uh, another function that a network can have, and this is one that normally we think about as not being good, but in fact, in the, in the context of Bergson, it is a good thing. Networks can also generate variability. And why do we want variability? In general, when we learn, we need to inject variability in the things that we do. And so, if you're trying to learn to do a motor action, you need to vary it around and to test how well those variations work in order to arrive at a, at a good um, uh, model or a good um, uh, outcome for your, for your <coughs> learning. And so this is often, birdsong is often put forward as a model for reinforcement learning. It's a beautiful case because birds, at least in the team that David works with, sing just one song. And so you have a very well-defined motor output that you can uh, very well quantify deviations and look for uh, changes in variability. So in that case, uh, as the bird learns to sing, it, it generates an approximate song. Uh, trial by trial, there's variability. Those um, changes are evaluated by sensory feedback, and somehow that feedback is incorporated to improve further movement. In the birdsong circuit, this, this set of nuclei here uh, in blue, called the anterior forebrain pathway, have been uh, already identified as the set of nuclei that are responsible for generating that variability. And so that's going to be uh, the target of where, where we look. It also turns out that in the adult, even after the bird has learned its song, uh, variability continues to, to be part of, the, part of the song. And it's a variability that depends on social context. So when the bird is singing alone, what you're seeing here uh, are deviations in this fundamental frequency of a particular syllable of the song. When the bird's singing along, alone, that syllable uh, frequency is quite variable. Whereas when it's singing in the presence of a potential mate, uh, it, it uh, sings a much more precise song, much more stereotype song. And so even through adulthood, the bird uh, maintains this degree of variability that's been actually shown to be important for the bird to maintain the quality of the song through adulthood. If you get rid of that variability, the song will actually uh, degrade over time. So what might be the substrate for this modulation of variability? All I'm going to do here is zoom in on one of the areas in that anterior forebrain pathway. I showed you uh, three nuclei. I didn't point to them in detail, but they consist of a 
essentially a thalamocortical loop. So areas, uh, nuclei in the bud's brain that correspond to uh, thalamus, that's DLM, uh, HBC and, and LMAN are, are cortical-like areas. And where we're gonna really focus is this basal ganglia-like area called area X. So area X has some properties that are very analogous to mammalian basal ganglia. It gets its input uh, from this cortical region through medium spiny neurons, medial spiny neurons, and its outputs are through palatal cells. Those palatal cells are oscillatory, so just like in uh, basal ganglia, they fire repetitively at a fairly fixed frequency. Why this area is thought to be interesting for this, for this question of modulation and variability is that it, get, it is the area that gets a sort of contextual modulation. So context is coming in here in the form of, a, of dopamine that comes in from area VTA that signals to the bird the different uh, behavioral context it's, it's um, working under. And I should point out that David's lab have previously shown that, oh, that, sorry, that sentence came to me. I used to have a newer version. So uh, David's lab have shown that if you just manipulate dopamine, you can reproduce the behavioral uh, changes that are, that are an invariability that are seen at normal. So we know that dopamine is the key player in the uh, ability of the bud to change the degree of variability. All right, so let's just have a look at what those palatal output neurons are doing in, uh, in these two different contexts. So in the presence of the female, you can see that the firing rate is lower and everything is more uh, regular, whereas when it's alone, you start to see these higher firing rates and also the, the appearance of these uh, large uh, patches of, um, of variable uh, firing. What might be the cause of differential firing in these cells? So David's uh, lab, uh, Agatha, in David's lab, has done some uh, intracellular recordings to look at the kinds of inputs that are coming into the palatal cells. And here's a trace from, from one of those recordings. So what you see is something that was actually previously unknown. These cells are getting not just inhibitory input from the, from the uh, medial spiny neurons, but they're also receiving a strong excitatory input. So these uh, blips that you see here are excitatory inputs from a previously unidentified cell type. That input is strong, as you can see. You know, these are single um, EPS, EPS uh, uh, P's in this case. Uh, they're periodic. If we look at the interval between them, it's quite regular. And they're also uh, divergent. They, the same input occurs simultaneously on many downstream neurons. And so those three things uh, give us something very interesting. They give us the possibility for this excitatory cell to be a mechanism to control the population output of a whole bunch of, of <coughs> downstream cells. Another thing that you should see in this slide is that that excitatory input is very often tightly temporally locked to an inhibitory input. Right, so following this excitatory blip, you often see this uh, negative blip that seems like a very tightly timed uh, inhibitory input that comes immediately after. What happens when we uh, add dopamine is that the frequency in which these uh, events, the excitatory and inhibitory event, are temporally linked uh, de uh, increases. Right? So dopamine seems to modulate that degree of coupling between excitation and inhibition. So now let's put all those, three, all those things together uh, into a, a model to propose what might be going on here. So what we'd, like to, what we'd like to suggest is that we essentially are seeing two different microsecond motifs. One case in which this, this new excitatory cell is speaking to a population of downstream palatal cells on its own. But as we add or, or take away dopamine, we switch that microcircuit from one in which the excitatory cell is driving uh, independently to one in which there seems to be this tightly coupled inhibitory input in the loop as well. And so dopamine presumably takes this, the, this inhibitory neuron in or out of this microcircuit. So what's the consequences of that? So what we can now do is take that microcircuit motif and build a little model that tells us uh, what that does to the firing of the palatal cell. So remember that the palatal cells are also, uh, so we have two different neurons that are firing periodically with different frequencies. The palatal cells have an intrinsic frequency and they tend to fire regularly. And now they're being driven by this excitatory cell which is also firing regularly. That's actually the recipe for building uh, a system that has chaotic dynamics. <coughs> so the way that we, that, we, um, that we look at that mathematically is we build what's called a phase response curve. So we try to predict the phase timing of the next, of the next spike 
and we look at how having an input at a particular point in the neuron's oscillatory cycle shifts the phase of the next spike. So the phase response curve tells us that. It tells the phase shift of the next spike as a function of the phase in the cycle at which an input comes in. And so I won't, I won't go through exactly how that works, but what we get out of that is something very similar to what we've already seen. So before I showed you a map that maps the input the output of one layer of a network onto the input of the other. Now I'm showing you something very similar. It's also a map that takes the phase of the firing of a single neuron onto the phase of the firing of the next neuron. So given, um, given that it's being driven by this excitatory cell, how does the phase of the next firing of the neuron change? And so these two different microcircuits have, you know, as we saw before, two different kinds of maps that map um, um, phase to phase. In this case, the firing map has the property that when you drive it with, you know, let's start at some arbitrary phase, we look up where it goes to, we again reflect across that input, and you can see that a given trajectory, if we go from phase to phase to phase, bounces all over the place, right? So at, on every cycle, you're going to hit a different phase as you, as you iterate around this map. Whereas this firing map has the same property that I pointed out before. It has this one point at which the firing, which the map crosses the input equals output line. And what that gives us is, again, a stable fixed point. So we start anywhere in this, in this map, we iterate it a few times, and we're going to end up at that stable fixed point. So these two maps give us a very different dynamics of what, um, what the neurons that are driven like this are going to do. So let's <coughs> see the consequences of that. So here, uh, we're just taking two different neurons that are initiated with two different phases, right? So we set, the, we set up the neurons, they have some random phase um, relative to one another of their initial firing, and now they're both being driven by the excitatory cell. So from, uh, from cycle to cycle, the black neuron is jumping around all over the place, and so is the red one, and they're both jumping around in completely different ways. So that says that the distance you know, that of, of timing between any two uh, successive spikes is going to be variable, right? It, it goes all over the place, and those two neurons are firing in a completely uncorrelated Whereas two neurons that are driven by, by this map, you can start them with very independent phases. Those phases will stay different for the first couple of cycles, but because of that fixed point, they iterate onto the same value. So very soon, they're going to be firing with a constant phase, that is regularly, and they're going to be firing synchronously. So that all of these neurons are going to end up firing uh, with a constant frequency and at the same time. So does this one change in the addition of dopamine can flip this microcircuit between these two different states and lead to very different behaviors of these output set of palatine neurons. So we, we imagine that we're looking at the, at the behavior of all of the, all of the outputs of very X. Depending whether we have uh, this situation or this situation, we're going to get completely different um, population behavior. All right, so that was another example of being able to predict the network properties from biophysics. So here we're looking at the synchrony and the, and the variability of the output population in this basal ganglion-like area. And the way that we got there was looking at the microcircuit and deriving, again, an iterative map that, that told us and sort of captures the, the fundamental dynamics. All right, so I'm going to stop there, but just to flesh up sort of where our, uh, what our next project is. So this is... Uh, a new project that we've just started with Rafa Eusta's lab at, um, at Columbia, and a, a little bit a higher level of ambition. So here, um, like a zebrafish, one can actually see every neuron while the animal is behaving. And so this gives us an opportunity <coughs> there about something between 800 and 3,000 neurons in an animal like this. In principle, what kind of animal is it? It's a hydra. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> cendarian hydra. Yeah, I, I thought it was on the play. Uh, it's a tiny little uh, creature. Uh, transparent, uh, they have GFP working, and also calcium uh, uh, indicators uh, in, expressed in all the neurons. And so we can look at the activity. Hopefully, with a neuron of this scale, we can actually model it almost completely and try to understand how the patterns that emerge from that model of the network activity actually govern these complex behaviors that, uh, that the animal uh, generates. All right, so just acknowledgments. So, uh, Talked mostly here about work by Alison Duffy in my lab, uh, in collaboration with David and Agatha, and some previous work by, uh, by Rebecca Mies and also Heather Heather Barnett and Juliana 
this is an old photo of the lab. This is a, a, a group trip that we did with Eric Shea Brown and Slab, who's a, another theorist at the University of Washington, and a close collaborator also. She's the product architect at the Allen Institute, where she's been since 2005. She previously served as the director of structured science at the Allen Institute. She has a bachelor's in neuroscience and mathematics with a biology concentration from Bard College, and a PhD in biophysics and molecular genetics from the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She um, did postdocs in biological structure and otolaryngology at the University of Washington, and her research focuses on the basis of neuronal diversity and structure function relationships in brain. <coughs> and the topic of her presentation is a survey of neuronal function in the mouse visual cortex, diving into data from the Allen brain research. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, well, thank you for inviting me here, and thanks to the other speakers as well for um, keeping us excited about the science that they're doing through late afternoon on a Thursday. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about work that the whole Allen Institute is doing. Um, this is over 100 people that focused on some of the data in the project I'm talking about today. And it's a little bit different because rather than just sort of one story about a scientific question that's being asked, this is more about creating some tools and an opportunity for the entire community to start mining and asking questions about um, the data itself. So one of the goals of the Allen Institute is to tackle some really big questions in neuroscience. And as a whole organization, we're set up really to start teasing apart questions that can start answering um, what are the parts of the brain? How do they put together? How are they connected? How do they receive and store and respond to information? And then eventually, ultimately, what goes wrong in disease? So in order to do this, we've taken a reductionist approach to try to create sort of a, a reverse engineering approach to the brain, both for mouse and human. And much of the way that you think about the way something like an iPhone or any kind of electronics instrument is put together, um, there's an approach by which you have to understand the parts, or you can create and engineer the parts. You have to understand the circuit and the wiring and how those work together. And then you have to have some sort of understanding of the software that is actually running it and operating it. And so for us, we've kind of applied these properties to thinking about the brain and how to understand the components. Those components are the cells or the synapses, the cognition, which would be sort of the processing that's going on, and then the computation, which would be some sort of integration of the signals that are there running the system itself. So um, over time, we've created a number of different projects that have resulted in um, data repositories and tools to start analyzing these specific parts that we've taken a reverse engineering approach to identify. So in terms of the components, we um, have generated a large of data that's looking at the parts of, of the brain itself, starting to look at cell types, and this project is ongoing. Um, we're also looking at some of the wiring logic associated with how the mouse brain is wired and connected. And then our most recent project that we just started working on a couple of years ago now, um, but only recently providing data to the community on, is on how does the brain compute. And we're using what we're calling a brain observatory for this because we're needing to look at the living brain to understand more about how it's actually processing information. So that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. Um, the other projects have been around longer, and all of the information that's there is actually on our website and completely open for everybody. So um, the idea of a, a brain observatory is something that uh, sort of emerged a while back in thinking about how, how do people learn something about the, the stars? Well, they gaze at it, and they extract information, and then they can create models hypotheses or maps from looking at the stars. We found that if you think about the mouse in the same way and looking into the, the, the mouse's brain specifically, you can start learning a little bit more about the specific features that are creating uh, kind of a, a universe of information and logic within the mouse brain. So the idea of the brain observatory is really to use uh, that same sort of analogy of understanding the brain from the perspective of gathering data to inform us about what kind of information will be able to so to do that, we created this brain observatory. And the model system, sort of the first project that we have in the brain observatory, is focused on understanding visual processing in the cortex. So the approach that we basically took is to try to understand how do cells respond to sensory input in, in an awake human animal. And in this case, that would be the mouse. 
So the way Processing itself is happening in the cortex of the mouse, and that's shown here. Um, so this is just a, a schematic looking from the top down at the mouse's brain, and this is a cross section of the, the cortex. In this particular case, this is focusing on the visual cortex. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to basically create a survey of what the activity is that's going on in the visual cortex by inventorying and mapping the responses to a functionally defined. And the particular behavior that we chose to look at is processing of visual information, where we would then gather data that would include wide field imaging of the, the cortex at the superficial level, single cell resolution imaging of evoked responses um, through a calcium label that we're looking at, and then ultimately being able to look at the tuning analysis or the output of some of the features and functions that are happening at this level. And to start with, we'd be looking just at the visual cortex, but ultimately we would hope to be able to associate some of the information we're learning through other parts of the brain well by gathering data in other parts of the brain. So this is just a, a model of, of the experiment setup that we would be using. Um, this is a mouse here, this is sped up, this is uh, not real time, it's about two, three times as fast as what's going on here. Um, the mouse is standing here on a little wheel, it's kind of like a, a disc that can spin if the mouse wants to move, it can move, it can run, it can walk, it can sit still as it's doing here. And then while the mouse is sitting there on the wheel watching a visual stimulus on a screen in the background, we're actually recording the visual response um, through an output of a genetically coded calcium indicator dye called GCAP6. So if you look at the cross section here of this particular mouse, you see that the layer uh, in the cortex that's labeled is layer 2, 3, and we're actually imaging down into that layer um, using a two photon microscope, and you can do this in real time. So, sort of modes of data that we have here is what brain area we're looking at. The mouse line in this particular case is, is COX2, which labels an excitatory set of neurons. In and the visual stimulus that I'm showing you here is drifting gratings that are sped up quite considerably. So that's basically the experimental paradigm that we seek to now apply many, many, many times to create a data matrix that contains a lot of different information by parsing in a systematic way different regions, in this case of tiling across the visual cortex, looking at different cell lines that are labeled <coughs> with that particular reporter, and then exposing the mouse to different visual stimuli over time. Doing this hundreds of times for each uh, field of view here and multiple different layers and regions for multiple different mice, and looking at multiple different cell classes that we've now labeled. Uh, and then also sharing a common set of stimuli, but a controlled set of stimuli, and gathering data for all the different visual stimuli that we have across many of these different other variables. So, an example of what we get in this sort of data matrix if you're looking down at the surface of the cortex, <coughs> spatially here in the visual area. This just represents one particular experiment, in this case, say, for an animal that is a 4B line, in this particular case, this would be gathered from layer 4 in the cortex. And for a particular field of view of those cells, like what we saw in the previous slide, you could extrapolate individual response information on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, and then represent that to how it correlates with the stimulus that the mouse is seeing. So uh, in order to do this at scale, which is one of the things we need to do to generate large quantities of data for analysis, we set up an experimental pipeline that allows us to quantitate these cellular responses in vivo over a very large number. And this just sort of walks through the process that these animals would go through over the whole course of an experiment. Uh, we basically have a, a series of different mouse lines that we would use. Those mice go through a process by which they're implanted with a cranial window so that we can actually see the brain. We then define the functional areas that we're interested in looking at by subjecting the animal to a set of visual stimulus tasks where we map out the physical area that the visual system is responding to. Um, we then have a passive behavior opportunity that we're looking at here. This is animals that just choose to either walk or run, but we, we track that behavior. And then we perform two, two photon in vivo imaging with a stimulus presentation so that we can extract out the information of what cells are responding to the stimulus in this particular mouse model. We also gather data um, by focusing a camera on the eye so we can look to see where the eye is looking. And we also have a camera that focuses on the body of the animal. So in addition to the actual data of the physiology happening here in the mouse, mouse's brain and cortical surface, we're also looking at an assortment of other types of metadata that allow us to collect auxiliary information to tell us something about the mouse's state. Um, we then verify that we're um, looking at the right area in the mouse's brain um, prior to euthanizing that animal and then collecting its brain and mapping spatially 
that the content of what that whole range shape is into a common reference framework that we can then computationally align with the data itself. So that whole process is then, that data acquisition process has a complementary data analysis process on the back end um, that involves the definition of the visual areas here by creating a visual map that um, is computationally aligned with a known definition of annotated areas that do uh, align with um, the basic anatomy that's shown here. So there's a functional anatomy map that's aligned to a spatial anatomy map. We then also detect the cells through a signal detection algorithm that allows us to quantitate and then extract out the information about exactly how much and to what level those cells respond in a very standardized way. Uh, we then integrate that particular response data with the metadata related to the animal's state, the animal's gaze, whether or not that animal is running or standing still. Um, and then all of that data is ingested into a data warehouse that gives both uh, access to the data through an API for programming interface, as well as access to users who want to manipulate the data in ways that might add on different kinds of analytical schemes other than the ones that we have right now, which I'll show you in a second. So the data output that we have here is all very standardized. We're using the NeuroData Without Borders format, which means um, there, that's basically a, a new standard that many are using, meaning that each one of these features that we identify, we're creating a, a standard and a de definition for what those features are experimentally so that others can learn from them as well. Okay, so right now we have this data that's pretty much the equivalent of about 30,000 different identified quantified cells <coughs> over hundreds of experiments now um, in an online presentation format of the data. So this is just a website that we now have, which is the URL for it. Um, this is stemming off all of our other Allen Institute websites, where you can analyze the cell response properties based on these different dimensions of the brain area where the data is acquired from, the cell classifier where we're using as a proxy for the class, <coughs> these different three lines that are shown here, um, and then the stimulus set. So that we're right now using five different visual stimulus sets here. We have a drifting grading, which is what we just looked at in the video, static grading, which looks the way it looks right here, um, a series of natural scenes. We basically let the animal look at a set, a known set of about 118 just different photographs. Um, we have a little clip of a natural movie, just a movie for the mouse to watch. And then we also use locally sparse noise, which sort of looks like confetti, and that helps us map the entire visual field that the mouse is exposed to. So the data that we have here that's browsable shows you sort of just a representation where you can kind of point and click through and to define which area you'd like to look at in more detail from these different six mouse lines and these five visual stimuli. When you do that, you basically will get a map of the very rich functional data that is going to characterize the response properties of that visual stimulus. So this is just an example panel with no particular logic behind this. It shows you the different Cree lines we're looking at. Each one of those Cree lines shows an enriched population of neurons. And then the different kind of visual stimulus exposed where what these sort of interesting colorful plots are are star plots and fan plots, um, star was first plots. Um, these are showing you the different response properties, either of, in some cases, fields of cells, um, in some cases, individual cells, and those individual cells have response properties that are enriched or preferring, in some cases, natural scenes or a particular direction of the drifting grading, in which case it's shown that the cell's response preferences in a, in a given direction. So there's literally 30,000 different sets of these experiments now where all of these are standardized and quantitated in ways that allow people to really dig down into the data. And when I say people, I mean some of the scientists at the Allen Institute, but we have a small number of people looking at this data right now. The intent is for people in the community to do even more of this kind of experimental analysis. So one of the things that we've learned just early, we've done a lot of, uh, a little bit drier experimental analysis into some of the quality controls and standards, a way to improve our data. But one of the things that we're just sort of learning now as we analyze some of the data starts to address one of the questions of the information processing sequence in the mouse visual system. So the primate visual system, actually in humans and non-human primates, um, has a ventral stream that's largely thought to mediate object recognition or, or the white that the visual system sees, and a dorsal stream which mediates the spatial recognition of where something is in space. And um, it's been thought for some time that the mice probably have an analogous pathway, but it's a little bit harder to evaluate this due to the difficulty in getting the mouse to tell you what it's responding to and, and learning behavior that would allow us to capture that information. So Wayne and Burkhalter used a lot of histological analyses uh, a few years ago now to map out a likely spatial representation that could resemble this um, object recognition versus spatial location and navigation pathways um, in the mouse. 
And we're actually seeing now some data that would suggest that that's possibly the case. So if we expose the animals to this view of the natural scenes, 118 different scenes, what we can basically describe now is a set of image selectivity per cell preferences that are very quantitative. And so what these little plots are here that have lines is just a representation of where for all of the 118 images that an individual cell experiences in a field of view, it may have a preference for firing for one of those scenes as opposed to another. So low image selectivity is shown here, where basically for every single one of those different 118 scenes, this particular cell or the cell that's measured here will fire, and that's shown by the sort of radius of many different responses. Whereas this one fires just a little bit more preferentially to this particular scene um, that's mapped by this position on this radius. This one has several uh, scenes that it will, or images that it will recognize, and this particular cell is very, very, very preferential to one particular image. So that's basically a, me a measure of image selectivity that we can, we can map. And then if you look across the different lines that we have, the, the transgenic mouse lines, you can look at the trends for which particular cells, and these pretty tight error bars, you measure many, many, many cells, are either preferring for one visual area on it, this visual area reflects that um, what or the ventral stream, whereas this particular visual area re reflects the putative uh, where visual stream. And this is consistent with the Wang and Burkholder finding, but from a completely diff different type of mode of data that's behaviorally extracted. Um, what also supports this is that we, we actually have noticed, I mentioned this here, but more cells seem to be tuned to the presence of running as opposed to not running in uh, this particular area, which is associated again with the dorsal stream, which is the, the wear stream. And that would be consistent with the idea that that would be something that's linked more closely to a motor behavior. Um, but we haven't looked at that yet. And some of the questions related to what we eventually would like to look at do relate to how object recognition as well as the cognitive hierarchical processing happens that can be measured through the kind of data that's gathered through these sorts of analyses. So um, some of the future development that we have ahead of us, there's a lot to look at, involves just expanding this database. Um, we're under a process of trying to define, further define uh, cell classes that are actually uh, going to more accurately represent individual uh, cell functions and see if we can get a tighter grip on what kinds of cell groups <coughs> they respond to or don't respond to particular stimuli in a cortical circuit. We're going to be adding more to the population dynamics by recording not just uh, at the superficial whole fields through the layer of the cortex, but simultaneously through the entire depth of the cortex using um, electrode arrays that are called multiprobes in this case, where they can actually, very, very small arrays that get inserted into the depth of the cortex and record from neurons simultaneously throughout the cortex. And ultimately, all of this data is fodder for people like Adrian to start developing neuron network models. And you know, this is just massive quantities of data that through, uh, we recently had a workshop this last summer we get people together to start thinking about what kinds of questions and answers can be parsed through this vast quantity of data. And so some of these right now, we have our computational scientists asking these kinds of questions. But once you start getting a sense of the depth of the data, there, there is no end of information to model. So, uh, so in summary, I just want to point out that uh, the purpose of this kind of project is not just for us to learn something about the visual system, but for us to share what we're learning with others. Um, in some cases, it's how we're learning, so we're putting together application program interfaces as well as little software development toolkits for people to access directly on our site so that they can, they can expand what we're learning. Um, we're really interested in gathering feedback from the scientific community to shape future studies. So we're using a set of, of known visual stimuli that are sort of an industry standard um, that, that's the work <coughs> And moving forward, we've got ideas for maybe other kinds of visual stimuli that we want to use or other types of experiments or potentially pre-transgenic animals that would be interesting to, um, to evaluate in this kind of an observatory model. And so one of our goals, this is actually sort of an indirect segue into I think, the next um, talk that's going to be happening as part of the, the South Lake Union Collaborative Talk, is all of these kinds of approaches work better when they're open, when they're done in a very open design and where it's very clear what kind of data is going to be out there, where that data is standardized and where it's done at very large scale, at least for the kinds of questions that, that we have, it helps to have numbers in the scale of thousands when we're talking about individual cell response properties for something that is a complex behavior. So it's great when you can have a, a tiny experimental model like the zebrafish where you can see it right there and you can evaluate and track that information in a more amenable um, system than when you can with a mouse. So 
um, we kind of get around to that by doing this work that we're doing at scale. So um, this is just the website as it is right now. This is where we have all of our data and tools accessible. Um, this particular project that I talked about today was just, again, the Allen Brain Observatory, and that's located right up here. Um, the other data that's associated with the connectivity apps that we have, as well as the cell types, is also linked to that particular portal. And I think um, we've got a history of also making maps to help people actually understand where and space the cells are. So with that, I just um, you know, wanted to thank again, the organizers for putting together um, this, this collaborative meeting. And to over 100 people contributed to this, so 100 people plus others at the Allen Institute who worked on uh, the Great Observatory project. Kiana and I'm an undergraduate interested in bioinformatics and data analysis and I have a question for Amy about um, possible like um, personal resources for sorting through your data as a student and learning how to navigate through different types of sets of data. Okay, that's, that's you can probably hear me anyway, but yeah. um, that's a great question and I would say that uh, one of the first things, I mean just as a sort of plug, I guess, for the website. So there are some tools that we have here for, for just our website and our tutorial section, um, as well as in, if you drop down here, there's a help section um, that will walk you through tutorials that are specific to using the data that we make available here. Um, there's also vast quantities of information that, I, that obviously places like GitHub are really, really good repositories for <coughs> community sharing. Um, I'm not sure about if others have thoughts on how, how to get in. I mean, they're, they're, every, every project has its own entry point. So for us, getting in means going to our application program interface or our SDK as well. Um, these require background. So they require that you put some time in. There's no sort of easy, immediate fix. You've got to play around with it. Um, but they're, they are so there's the application program interface, um, which is back into the data, comes with a lot of help information, software development toolkit, and the send us a message when you get stuck. Um, those are the tools that we have on our site. Okay. Thank you. Which is that we run this course, as Amy mentioned, at um, Friday Harbor over the, the summer that typically uh, is for grad students, but you could throw your application in if you wanted to come up. So what, what we try and do there, and this is partly for the benefit of the development uh, of the database, is we bring 24 students from all over the country, uh, quite a few of them from UW, to you know, learn how to use the tools. And so <coughs> there's a Python boot camp that happens on campus, so most of the tools that are being built are in Python, so that's a great, if you, if you don't know Python, that's a great starting point to, to learn it. And then uh, so you might be able to contact some of the students who have taken that in working with that database. So, so people here I know have taken that. So. Okay, thank you. Question for Cecilia. Uh, so I'm, I'm not very familiar with the development of neurons, but it seemed that the most posterior axon that developed was the one that sort of led to the um, control of breathing and the heartbeat and all that. I was under the impression, and I could be completely wrong, that those sort of um, inherent physical attributes appeared very early in development. Uh, do they, does that axon develop as late, later than all the others? Or? Okay, yeah. So. Um... It, it develops later than the others, but it still develops very early in development. So, so in mammalian embryos, the that whole vagus um, organization is in place in what would be the equivalent of human development. I would say four or five weeks of, of human development. So, so it's still plenty early. Yeah. Okay. 
Stick with that. I'd like to follow up also to uh, a question to Celia. I kind of to connect it maybe to the following talk. I apologize for very bad remembering the names, but why was more in the anatomy and, and the special uh, organization space time and other more in electrophysiology? And the question to my mind was, because I'm kind of interested in, in the two, are you are you looking into ways to use electrophysiology to actually record the firing patterns and um, to try to understand the coding in them, how that actually works into the development of profile and to, to understand that also for later use in uh, applications. So I look at it more from an application standpoint in, a, in obstetrics where we are trying to tap into the heart rate variability and decode that. And for that we need to understand what the vagus nerve is actually doing. So understanding the language of the vagus code, uh, I think that there could be an interesting way to do that in a model such as yours. Right. Yeah, so, so I, I did say a number of things that the zebrafish is great for, but uh, electrophysiology <coughs> is, is not really one of them because it's so tiny. So there are, are rather few people who have been successful at reporting even from big neurons uh, in the zebrafish larval brain. I mean, more successful in, in adult, but then you lose all the attributes of, of transparency and so on. So yeah, that's a weakness, I guess. Although, to the extent that we're happy with calcium imaging, that's a big debate. Uh, as a representation of firing patterns in the, in the neurons, it's that's great good. for that. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and there's a lot of models now, uh, Janelia and others, who are, who are looking at whole brain activity patterns in the future. So that's definitely happening. I'm not sure if it's at this, this coding development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, Around um, how all of you, um, and in particular as a major artist coming out of Yale, how do you think about data management in the short term and the long term? And are you, are you partnering? With, we're in a, the good news is we're in a tech rich area, and the bad news is we're in a tech rich area. How, how do you think about that? Uh, I think about this a lot, um, and it's a it's an ongoing challenge, a really big challenge. So I recently attended um, a workshop in Washington. See actually specifically on challenges of, of open data and data management in the neurosciences. And the resounding community word is there needs to be centralization of data storage, management, all the rest. Um, and this was somewhat pointed at NIH and NSF as, as please government provide us some sort of centralized agency much like what we have for something like NCBI and PubMed. And they can't and won't partly because there's some government mandate that they don't do that sort of thing. Um, but it does raise an issue because there is no real centralist, single centralized system and everybody is looking for that kind of means of managing their data. So uh, we have a system that's frankly uh, really good for what we are doing now, but it is not as open and accessible and flexible as what we would develop if we'd known we would need to do that 10 years ago when we were developing our systems. And so we're now looking forward towards uh, really just focusing on open data on all kinds of open software systems when possible and um, cloud-based or distributed storage systems. And the kind of management strategies for that usually federate the data, they federate both storage as well as access and build of the data. Um, and a lot of time and money usually has to go into building this out which is, I think, a challenge for individual investigator labs to, uh, to accomplish. But does the Allen have a preferred vendor for cloud? I mean, you can imagine how much, but do you, I mean, how, how are you approaching that? I don't know if you want to say anything else about this. Do you work with data all the time? But no, we don't. We don't. We're, this is very much a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, as you probably know, NSF and NIH now also have a company that's required to put a data management plan into, into your proposal, although they don't fund you to do it. But although I think it's we're reaching for putting in a budget for cloud storage is probably probably reasonable. They did for a while fund uh, a neuroinformatics stream as part of the CRCMS program, the computational, the collaborative research and computational neuroscience um, NSF NIH program, and that led to the establishment of at least a monthly uh, a database for um, neural data. It hasn't been significant 
really need to have someone more or less full time managing that problem. And at the moment, that's not generally included in the budgeting of the lab to do the grant. So it's kind of an unfunded mandate at the moment. But I think that will that will change given the acknowledgement of the report so far. Come back in January. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll all right, thank you all very much for coming. There is a reception outside. Thank you to the speakers for um, your excellent talks today. And we'll talk outside. The next session will be on big data. It will be at Mahaj on January 11th. Thanks.